So, Brian, I've known you from, for several years now, and when I first met you, your beat was totally different. You're not a gadget guy. You were writing about climate change and the environment and speaking truth to power. So, why this? What, made, what compelled you to write this story, to tell this, to tell this story? Uh, well, um, what better opportunity to speak truth to power than through the most powerful device of our time, right? Uh, sold by the most uh, valuable company, the most profitable piece of technology that has come out in decades and maybe ever. Um, so I think the opportunity to kind of, you know, examine this object uh, through a lens uh, that included, you know, the resource gathering at one end to its creation uh, and invention at the other, it really offers a, sort of an opportunity to look at every single step along the way. Um, and you can talk about mining and manufacturing and, you know, the global economy. So there's so many opportunities to kind of get a new uh, sort of perspective on, on how these things work. And I chose to do that through the prism of the iPhone. It is really like the most monolithic thing that's part of our lives. I was trying to think yeah. today about how many iPhones I've owned in my life and I couldn't. It's only been 10 years. Yeah. But it's like this thing entered my hands and then just changed form a bunch of times, but it was always the same. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, that's one thing about it, is that it has really, the software on it, I mean, the shape has changed minimally. It's always been this black rectangle, maybe white rectangle with rounded edges and a giant touchscreen. But yeah, okay, well, <laughs> minor deviations. Uh, but from day one, you know, the sort of the template that, that uh, Apple's designers and engineers came up with, this grid of apps, the touch screen, the swiping, um, this sort of vocabulary that we use to interact with it really hasn't changed much since uh, the inception 10 years ago. Um, and now it is. It's like one of the designers uh, who is responsible for making it this way uh, described it as being like water, which I think is a really useful way to, it is. We don't think about it. It's just everywhere. We're the fish in that scenario? Uh, I guess we're the fish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And it now, is. this is our opportunity to look at each other and say, oh, we are in water. We right? are in water. Yeah, we're breathing. It is like, I mean, despite being the most successful product of capitalism today, which I think is something you say in the book, it, it's also like really opaque, too. It's very difficult to get into it physically, and it's also very difficult to get into the company that makes it. So how do you begin to sort of pierce through that? Yeah. I think one of the really interesting things about the iPhone as a product um, is that Apple has very deliberately uh, sort of sealed it off, um, both metaphorically and literally, just physically as a product. You know, this is a device that is bolted together and screwed in with, you know, signature specialized screws that you can't just take your screwdriver out of the, you know, the, the toolbox and open it up and fix it. You have to buy this niche uh, pentalobe screwdriver if you even want to open it up yourself. And this is something that you own. So over the generations of the iPhone, that has just kind of led to this general sort of conception that this is just a thing that you take out of the box and you use and you don't ask too many questions about it. <laughs> so it is, you know, a little difficult both to pry that thing open and to, you know, kind of start from scratch. You know, when I started this, I, I, I had worked, as you said, uh, as a science and technology journalist for 10 years, and yet, I hadn't thought that much about the iPhone as being anything more than this popular consumer product. And uh, I actually lost my iPhone in the back of a cab, and I think everybody has that moment where you're just kind of like jarred awake by the absence of this thing that has become so ingrained into our daily routines, where you're just like, Ugh, like it's ugly, it's, it's like itchy, you feel like you're like missing something. And I kind of struck me that it would be interesting to kind of investigate why that is, like what's compelling this feeling, you know? What is, uh, what is it that makes this object so central, so, uh, so necessary? Well, oh, it's a confluence of a lot of things, and that's what's so interesting about the iPhone, right, is that it's, as you say, a confluence technology where it's, it's filled with all of these components that on their own would be like interesting stories that one could write a whole book about, but they're all together in this single thing and both like designed and marketed in this totally brilliant way to yeah. make it feel like a completely self-contained thing that just dropped from the heavens. Right, right. <laughs> and in some ways that's exactly what Apple is kind of hoping how you conceive it that you know this you know this their their 
saintly technology guru stepped out in his black turtleneck and handed it down, you know, from the stage. Mock turtleneck. Mock turtleneck, sorry. Uh, and, and, and so it was, you know, there was iPhone. Uh, that's useful because then they can like really get people to focus on the features and talk about you know the cool things that it does uh, and it kind of covers up a lot of those histories and all that blood sweat and tears that go into making each one. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean not just in the labs at Apple but actually globally in the world and the mines and the factories right. and all the places where the all the iPhones begin their lives in these kind of elemental stages. There's yeah. a lot of labor there that needs to be unveiled, which is what your book does. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's got to be one of the most overquoted lines in technology, the Arthur C. Clarke line about how, you know, once technology becomes sufficiently advanced, uh, it functions like magic. Indistinguishable from magic. Indistinguishable from magic. what I believe the line is. Thank you. <laughs> and that is kind of, Apple has taken that and ran with it, um, with, with the iPhone, by sealing it up, by doing all these things, by perpetuating this narrative. But one of the things that it really sort of does gloss over is the fact that this is a tactile object made of metal that is pulled out of the ground, sometimes in very desperate uh, conditions and in desperate situations by real people, uh, some of whom have to go through great lengths to get this stuff, and this is happening on every continent, multiple places, and it's all feeding into a factory where people you know, work 12 hours a day on their feet doing this repetitive labor, uh, you know, screwing in a tiny component over and over and over and over. And it's just, there's this immense, almost incomprehensible amount of manpower and work and labor uh, that goes into every single one of these tiny devices that we just slide into our pockets and kind of use it to tweet. <laughs> I was going to ask you later, but I, this, you just mentioned tweeting, so I'm going to ask you now. I mean, you must have this, he, I mean, he travels all over the world in this book, you must have this very sort of complex, I can't even imagine how you keep it all in your head, this like supply chain. Uh, and then at the, at the same time, the semiotic power of the iPhone is so great that like, when you're tweeting, do you just forget about it all? Yeah, you do. And I think no matter how uh, much you really, you know, work to sort of integrate all of these different stories into your portrait of how this device is, it's a constant, you know, sort of tension in, you know, your daily use because it has become so normalized. It's mm -hmm. so, you reach for it, you, you hit the app, you go. You know, it's, it's not, there's not a lot of thought involved in opening Google Maps anymore. It's just, you know, drop a pin, like, where am I going? Or yeah, I'm going to text message someone. There isn't. It's become almost instinctual. Yeah. So, um, I would hope that, you know, one of the outcomes of, of reading this book is that, it does sort of, uh, you know, sort of complicate the view and the relationship we have with our gadgets in a productive way. I hope that uh, we do kind of see this fuller, more nuanced portrait of what it is that we're carrying around. In order to get to that place for you, your journey began with like literally smashing an iPhone to smithereens to find out what the component parts were. <laughs> yeah. Was that really satisfying? And was it like your phone that you did or did you buy one just to smash? I this bought is the a, important question. Yeah, I bought a smasher. Um, <laughs> and I, I bought one just so it was all above board. I went to the flagship store in um, in in New York, uh, and I, I I bought an iPhone six, which I think was the one that was out at the time, and I shipped it off to a metallurgy lab where they usually they have these complex instruments that they use to smash ore to find out like what's in a certain kind of rock and what you can get out of it and what the chemical composition is. So they had never, they were kind of like, uh, come again? <laughs> you want us to smash an iPhone with a rock crusher <laughs> and then measure the specific... Uh, oh, they must have been so psyched. Uh, well, they were until they did and then the battery caught fire, which <laughs> I heard caused a little bit of an issue because, you know, it's a uh, lithium which is in the battery, is a really volatile <coughs> element. <laughs> so it turns out that dropping this rock hammer on it uh, really fast can cause little explosions. But we got past it, <laughs> and we figured out that it had all kinds of interesting stuff in it. You know, there's the most valuable thing in your iPhone is gold. It has about a dollar worth of gold in it, which is a Where lot. is it? The gold? Yeah, what's it used for? The gold is in uh, actually a number of the different components, uh, but it's, it's, it's used, it's a really good conductor. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, it's, it's one of the, it's 
one of the more precious metals, and almost everything else is worth very little. Uh, there's arsenic in your iPhone, so don't eat it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, uh, and all of these, again, like, from there, you can say, okay, well, there's, there's tin in the iPhone. Um, and I had the opportunity to go to one of the places that Apple lists as its tin supplier, which is in, in Bolivia, in one of the oldest and biggest running mines in the world. This is the same mine that bankrolled the Spanish Empire, uh, that was one of the most productive silver mines in the world. And while it was at its height, the city that was doing this mining was as big as London at the time. Um, and this mountain has been mined just to the bone, and now you can get more mundane metals like tin, uh, which may wind up in your iPhone today. And some of the people mining it are, uh, you know, very, very young, which is one of the one of the sad stories and one of the things that's uh, a tragic reality about getting the iPhone is that there's uh, people as young as six years old who are digging into these mines and getting some of the tin out. So that's terrifying. Yeah. I mean, because you describe the mine in your book, and you can't, I mean, you don't even make it like an hour because it's so scary and claustrophobic. Yeah, my partner who was in there just, I, I started having the beginnings of a panic attack because, I mean, you're in this mine, and it's it's low for one thing, it's, uh, it's held up with just these old splintering wooden beams, uh -huh. and it's uh, really, I mean, they have, they have collapses and cave-ins all the time, uh, like 60 people a year die in these mines, and... It's, uh, yeah, I don't blame him for like, you know, having a, having a panic attack and wanting to get out of there, but it was, I feel like it was important to sort of try to relay that sense that, that, you know, people who toil in that environment every day help make this thing possible. Yeah, it's remarkable to think about just the global impact of the si this single object that mm -hmm. we think is so sort of self-contained, like from beginning to end. I mean, coming out of these mines, going through these factories in China that you had the opportunity to visit, passing through our our like wonderful polished Apple stores, you know, being mishandled and dropped in the toilet or the washing machine in my case, uh, <laughs> run over by cars, like swapped in, swapped out, right. eventually recycled, and they end up in like deconstructed in these sort of places all over the world, like in Africa. Yeah. I mean, what a journey it takes for just this one thing. Yeah, the life cycle is really incredible. Um, and, you know, a lot of, and they, they become very valuable as uh, reused items in black markets and as e-waste. So it was interesting to kind of check out some of those places uh, where, you know, we discard these things. We're, we're trained by Apple and by a lot of uh, different forces to get rid of it every year to 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 drop our iPhone uh, in a desk drawer or to you know try to sell it on eBay for less or to uh, to just to upgrade 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 so that's it's a really sort of prevalent thing that creates a lot of waste yeah yeah I mean I'm guilty of it I always upgrade my iPhone do you well I try to hold I try to hold on as long as I can yeah but then at a certain point I start feeling Although I do miss the iPhone 4. Yeah, that was your favorite? That was a good one. I love the shape of that thing. Yeah, it had kind of the sweet spot of the size, and yeah. <laughs> now they're huge. They're just like, yeah. <laughs> I know. I'm living that big life, so don't even <laughs> get me started. Um, one question I wanted to ask you about your travels. I mean, I know that you were traveling all around the world in these crazy, like, inaccessible and remote places, and you had a wife and a young child at home. And I yeah. can imagine that you were FaceTiming and corresponding through your phone. So, I mean, how do you maintain a kind of analytical distance about this object while you're also using it as like your primary lifeline to connect with your loved ones, you know? Yeah, well, I think that it's just a, just a great example of what does sort of make the iPhone so powerful. Uh, and that's exactly right. I would, you know, I, I, I also took screenshots as I went. So ever, I think I FaceTime with my little baby when he was just, you know, two months old even. And I have, you know, I take screenshots, so I have this sort of this whole like saga, <laughs> this story of him every every couple months and, you know, getting a little bit bigger. And I just FaceTime with him when I was on the first stop of the book tour in Seattle. And now he's old enough where he really recognizes me. He says, Dada, when he sees it uh, through the screen and he'll try to kiss the screen. He doesn't really understand <laughs> that it's Dad, me. Dad got small. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, so there is, uh, and, and I think, you know, one of the more personal stories I share in the book is that uh, when my wife found out she was pregnant, uh, and she's in the audience here too, so I might be embarrassing her, <laughs> yeah. but we, I, I, I didn't even think about it, really. I just, she, we, we, she called, and I, it was, you know, uh, cl clearly just by the sound of her voice, it was going to be an intense, you know, <laughs> emotional moment, uh, so we FaceTimed. 
uh, almost knee-jerk, and then she tells me that she's pregnant, and she's crying, and I'm crying, and I'm just notice that I'm just instinctively just hitting the, the screenshot button. So I'm taking screenshots of this, and I have this series of photos that they're some of my favorite artifacts in the world, or just, just this moment of just overwhelming sort of emotion, and I didn't have to think about it. I could just you know, pull the trigger, basically, and, and record that, that really beautiful human moment. Yeah, I mean, it's remarkable for how opaque the phone is, and I just want to call it the phone now. The phone, it's the phone. The thing, the fl yeah. I call it the flat thing in my house. The flat yeah. thing, where's the flat thing? Um, you know, they, it's like there's so much human in it. I mean, there's so much human in making it, there's so much human in designing it, and all the sort of like business drama that you get into in the book, but then also just like in our daily experiences, like how much goes through it. Yeah. I mean, for something that's, maybe it, maybe it has to be opaque so that we can see ourselves in it a little bit, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's part of its power. It is very simple uh, from the very earliest days. It was, you know, some of the things that, that we do hear about, the design uh, penchants of Steve Jobs and some of his imperatives really are true. And that's, he, it needed to be intuitive. Mm -hmm. It needed to be something that we could just interact with directly, uh, something that you could use without ever picking up a manual. Uh, he had all these things that really did have to go into it. Um, and, you know, it, it, it seems so simple, but it is also uh, really this <laughs> it's a, a product of a ton of labor and work mm -hmm. by, on the other side of the sort of supply chain parts that we were talking about, is the hidden history within Apple itself. You know, Apple has sort of given us this narrative about Steve Jobs and creating this innovation, and it's kind of implied that he was the chief inventor of the phone. Um, which again helps them sell phones because he's such a great salesman and he is a, he is a brilliant marketer and a brilliant sort of uh, you know curator of ideas and uh, technology editor is one way to I've heard it put but he, there was so many people working behind him working in you know with with really brilliant ideas who did really groundbreaking work who we've never heard about at all uh, so one of the other fun parts of this book was meeting the team who sort of, before Steve Jobs had any idea that there was going to be something that felt like an iPhone, looked like an iPhone, you know, uh, was an iPhone, there were these, this core group of really ambitious, dedicated engineers and designers who just really wanted to push the envelope for the sake of pushing the envelope. They really believed that technology was accelerating to the point where a mouse and a keyboard was gonna go out the window, it mm -hmm. was too cumbersome. Um, they wanted to try to figure out what the next interface was gonna be, the, what was the future of interacting with computers. And they settled on this idea of direct manipulation, touching, just reaching out, interacting with the media with your fingertips. They wanted it to move like paper when you would move it with your hands. They wanted, they wanted it to be like a physical object with uh, made of pixels. Yeah, it's interesting. That's something I didn't know at all until I read your book, that multi-touch, this idea of like, you know, using fingers to actually move information around predated the iPhone, that they were developing multi-touch sort of in secret, like a sort yeah. of skunk works project, right. and not telling Steve Jobs about it because they were maybe waiting to see, waiting for it to be ready for him, yeah. and waiting for the right moment to introduce it to him, because he was the kind of tempestuous character that could just shut a project down if you caught him on the wrong day. Right, exactly. Uh, you know, he would drop an expletive. He had a favorite phrase that maybe I won't <laughs> say here. But <laughs> what? Now I want to know. Yeah, oh, I mean, it was just like, this is shit. <laughs> and that would be the end of the phone, of any project. That would be the end of someone's, you know, months of hard work. Like, hey, is this good? And he'd go, this is shit, and you're done. That's not, it's not come back, try again, it's don't show this to me ever again. <laughs> uh, you're out. Uh, Multi-touch is one of those, you mentioned earlier, these technologies that have this lineage that go way back, and mm -hmm. that somebody should write a whole book about touch screens, because as I was re researching this, there just isn't that much in the popular body. Um, but it is, it has this fascinating legacy, beginning with musical technology pioneers, you know, Robert Moog and Bob Buchla, people who are kind of marrying, you know, sort of musical instruments to, to, to touch technology and people getting inspired by them. Oh, like theremin, do you mean? Theremin was maybe the root of touch, because these guys were inspired by theremin. Oh, I love theremin. that. Yeah. that's such a science fictional thing to begin with, right? It's right. Like, Ooh. Yeah, that was also one of the ideas, the, guy, the same guys that came up with the, the iPhone paradigm, that was another one of the technologies they looked at, actually, was these like giant 
range finding, you know, like maybe, yes. we're, you know, maybe instead of an iPhone, we would just be in rooms, you know, pulling at data like Minority Report. Yeah. Minority Report is such an often used yeah. example. I, th I wonder if they knew when they were making that film. And di yeah, they did. Boss Ording, maybe the genius sort of of design cited specifically. He saw a Minority Report and he said, wouldn't it be cool if we could do something like that? But much smaller. Much smaller. <laughs> this, yeah. It's like much smaller and more expensive. Yeah. <laughs> so it did worm its way in there. Yeah, yeah. It's, the, the influences come from all over the place. But it's, it's so fascinating to, hear, to read in your book like how kind of janky the original prototypes were for just like the multi-touch system. Like the fact that it was just like they would they set up this, well, you can explain it better than me, like a jerry-rigged thing with a projector and paper. Right, so once they decided that multi-touch, which is just the idea of having a sensor that would register more than two finger points at once, was going to be the core technology that was going to sort of propel uh, their experiments, they wanted to figure out a way to use Mac software with multi-touch. So they just really rigged, it, rigged up this real, like, this, this really sort of sloppy, inelegant, create, I mean, it was really, they were pulling stuff out of their garages, duct taping stuff together, and they came out with this table, I think it was even a ping pong table at one point. They wheeled it into the middle of this abandoned user testing lab. Uh, they put uh, this, this pre-existing touch screen, uh, this, this finger works pad, and they put a white piece of printer paper on top of it. They wheeled in a Mac, they've got a projector screen, and they, they duct tape on a, a, a camera lens to focus the home screen of the computer onto this white piece of paper. And that was the very beginning of the iPhone. This room-sized, crazy, you know, jury-rigged piece of technology that, and that's why they wanted to keep Steve Jobs out of that room, because if he opened that door and saw this ping pong table and a projector screen, and he would say, what the hell are you guys doing in there? But you isn't know? that what they showed him initially? So once they, once they had experimented with it, once they got it to work so you could do some basic demos, like you could grab a map and twist it and turn it and squeeze it, shrink it, once you could like scroll through web pages and kind of demonstrate some of the use cases, then that's when they were like, okay, let's, let's see if we can, you know, pique his interest with this. But not before that, not when it was still a mess. It had to be, Steve Jobs needed to see the road to, uh, yeah. to making a product. He needed to see a way to make money off of it. But then they showed it to him and he was like, this is shit. Right? <laughs> yeah, he was. <laughs> he was ambivalent at first. Uh, then he decided that, you know, Maybe it had some value. He came back and saw the demo again. And then he decided, you know what? Like, Microsoft is, is, is going to make one of these things. There's this, this other exec at Microsoft who keeps bugging me about this. I want to kind of stick it to him. And then fast forward a couple months, and he's saying, you know, multi-touch is great. I'm glad I invented it. <laughs> There's all these canonical Steve Jobs stories. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's, like, it's like, isn't it great? He just sounds like a jerk. I mean, that's... That's, you have to do that if you're going to be a leader at a huge company like that. Like, you have to sort of focus the energy and move forward. But like, I feel bad for all those people that worked on it for ages who thought they invented it. Yeah, exactly. But you, yeah. you profile a number of people like this in the book that you, know, you make a case are kind of the original ideators behind some of these technologies, right. like the man who invented the finger works pad that you mentioned briefly, Wayne Westerman. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's one of the more brazen claims and one of the more brazen examples of jobsiness is that in the presentation, he said, uh, you know, in the iPhone, he's like, and it's powered by multi-touch, and boy, have we patented it. <laughs> you know, like, and they didn't. They bought the company that had patented the specific kind of technology that they made. In fact, so I went and I tried to trace back the te this technology as far back as I could, um, and I got in touch with this really fascinating guy who works at CERN, which runs particle accelerators. And that was one of the very first multi-touch capable screens. Oh, Actually, are you going to show us the I'm gonna, I'm gonna, And I met with him, and he was so glad to have somebody you know, help share his story that he gave me one of the very first screens. I don't know if you can see it here, but it's primitive, and you could only touch you know, one, uh, or you could do like two buttons at once. It's basically just buttons. So what would this have been used for? Do you know? Like yeah, it was using for, for operating the settings of the second particle accelerator. It, yeah, it, There's a lot of thumbprints on this. It's, yeah, it's been handled. Yeah, <laughs> it's been touched before. I guess that's the occupational hazard of multi-touch. Right. Uh, but, but, I mean, and that's just one of the lessons of this story is that inventing something doesn't mean that you get the credit or that you get to be Steve Jobs. It means that one iota of an ingredient gets 
to enter this sort of this, this, this slipstream that will maybe end up in something like the iPhone one day. Yeah, it's difficult. I mean, you want to give credit to every person who had a little bit, but like Steve Jobs is the person that brought, I mean, Apple is the company that brought it all together into a right. product that actually right. changes the world. Yeah. Yeah, but exactly. I mean, how far back do you go? I'm sure there's someone even beforehand that had the inkling before that, and then before that, and before that. Yeah. It's turtles all the way down, or yeah. screens. Yeah, it's touch screens all the way down. Uh, and I poked as many of them as I could without boring the reader, I hope. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it, it, it is. It, it, that story could go in, in every direction for all the different technologies that make it possible. I mean, do you see yourself as like the writer of historical wrongs in this context? like? Ripping the veil off and showing all the people that actually made uh, maybe. these technologies happen. I, I, I kind of. I think that I, th I would be happy to be. Yeah. I think that there's the more that we think about all this stuff, the more that we get a truer idea of, of how it works. Ultimately, um, the, the more that we can think about it as a technology and as an amalgam of effort, and less as just a product that we buy and slip, you know, and just use. It's strange. I mean, if Apple really makes an effort to keep these stories obscured. I mean, you 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 came up against the wall of Apple public relations, I'm sure. Like, I did. These those doors are closed. I mean, you didn't get to talk to anybody <laughs> who actually. I mean, on the record, that actually worked with Apple. You talked to people that had were ex Apple because they're so like firm yeah. about that. Yeah, Apple and I had a uh, a lovely year long dance over emails and unanswered emails and of. Uh, semi-tense meetings at Apple HQ about this book. Uh, Apple has its handful of journalists that they know have bought, or, you know, uh, uh, I won't be that critical, but they, uh, that, that they that can rely on to, to communicate the stories that Apple wants to communicate. Let's put it that way. Um, they don't talk to anybody else. They have, you know, some of the best reporters in the country just can't get access to Apple's chief people because they know that if they don't need to. Everybody wants to know what Apple's doing, and if Apple just controls the narrative themselves, then there's less chance of it going off the rails. So I did. I spent a long time you know, tugging at shirt sleeves and tapping on shoulders and meeting Apple employees in dive bars and going over encrypted communications and really just you know, going to all ends to make sure that I could paint the fullest portrait I could. The second half is, is, of that is that the guys, that most of the team that made the original iPhone has since left Apple. They've burned out for a variety of reasons, or they've left, and I think they're tired of that veil. Mm. So they're just like, you know, it would be great if someone could get the true story out there. So I did have a lot of great conversations with uh, these people, who many of whom I consider to be some of the unsung geniuses of... Uh, of, uh, of the technology industry and design. Yeah, I was going to ask you, like, how, how did you get them to talk? But it sounds like they wanted to. A lot of them did. Yeah, some of them, you know, were... I did talk to a number of, app, of Apple employees who were still there, and that was harder. But people who've left, some of them were eager to set the record straight, yeah. <laughs> because they felt like they had been sort of forgotten? They're very diplomatic about it, you know? They have been... They, they understand how Apple works, and they don't want to anger anyone at Apple, but yeah, yeah. One of the guys was telling me that, you know what, there's not, nobody ever took a picture. We made, we built the most profitable, most influential piece of technology in maybe history, in the last 50 years, and there's not a single picture of us from those days that because documented it. Because it was so top secret? Because so everyone secret. was so busy that no one thought so to do it. Both, but, but mostly because it was so top secret. Nobody, you know, you can look at the patents and find the names, but yeah. It's, wow. Yeah. It's very, very secret. I mean, these guys were working in a, a giant dorm with badge readers round the clock. You know, they wouldn't go home. They wouldn't shower. They would sometimes sleep in the office. They would, you know, they, they couldn't talk to anybody about this. It was really intense and very secret. That sounds like hell in personal relationships. Yeah, it was. I had a number of uh, iPhone engineers tell me that uh, the iPhone is the reason that they're divorced, <laughs> that they, uh, you know, I'm sure that they're not the only ones for whom the iPhone is the reason that they're divorced. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At least they can take comfort in that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's something that you take repeated exception to in this book is this idea of just the lone inventor, that Steve Jobs invented the iPhone in the same way that like Edison invented the light bulb, which is kind of like this toxic thing, actually, because it obscures all these other people, and it makes people believe that you have to be a genius to do anything in this world, as yeah. opposed to just one of many geniuses working together on a team of 
people that are being paid well and work really hard. Right. Um, yeah, and we do have this sort of culture of like the startup hero, the founder, you know, the that you know the the Elon Musk is going to solve everything. And you know, Elon Musk is great. Uh, maybe he's the exception to the. I mean, he. There are people who are who really do a lot and do really good things, but. Even Elon Musk has teams of dozens and dozens and maybe hundreds of people who are making his visions possible that, that don't get the credit either. And it is, it's these complex interlocking ecosystems that, that, that do end up with the, with the products like this that, that, that can change, change things significantly. Well, one thing that I do think is interesting, that since you made that crack, uh, <laughs> is that one of the things that kept coming up in the interviews is that you know, they'd all want to talk about this ambivalence about what they've unleashed on the world, uh, that they, you know, that, they, that they're proud to be involved with it, but I couldn't yeah. get through an interview without going like, well, I don't really know what I've done here. <laughs> like, I go into a restaurant with my wife and she's like, look what you've done. That couple's sitting there on a date and they're not even talking to each other. This is your legacy. And they're like, maybe they're, or I'm sitting there, you know, on Sunday and my kids are playing and I'm, you know, looking at Twitter, scrolling through. Uh, and should I be more present? What's you know what what have I done? So so they have themselves this complex re uh, relationship to the technology too. Yeah, I mean transformative technologies go both ways. Yeah. And I'm sh I'm sure they saved lives and launched careers sure. and enlightened people and inspired people. They've also ruined relationships and um, you know made people leave mean comments on blogs or whatever it is <laughs> that the dark side is these days. Yeah, there there is it, it is it's a constant sort of push and pull. And for all the benefits it does, citizen journalism is one that is really important. Everybody has a camera. Everybody can document uh, injustice with a with a tap of a tap of a button now. And network, organize. You know, people organize protests through through iPhones. It is like a snake eating its own tail. That's the feel the the feeling I had a lot of times reading your book, where you're like going into the belly of the Chinese factory and you're taking photos with your iPhone to tell the story. It's like this totally crazy <laughs> recursive thing where, yeah. I mean, there's even that story in your book about the factory where like they're being monitored live by these sort of like iPhone tablets that are telling them like their stats while they're making the f iPhone accessories. Yeah. It never was, ends. It never ends. Yeah, that was really incredible. And I just kind of lucked into that because uh, I just met somebody in Shenzhen who want, really wanted to show me their factory and they were manufacturing iPhone cases and they had line workers in there, uh, but it was half factory, and the other half of their sort of business pitch was that they had the software, which was an app, which tracked factory workers who made iPhone products. <laughs> so it really was this crazy warping thing, and I walked in there, and they, there's these things like up on the screen, she's like, yeah, you can bring it up right here on your phone, and you can see that, you know, Susan is not making her quota, and I can know to go over to her station and yell at her, and, and it's just like, whoa, like, yeah. this is, yeah. Tools to facilitate, like, It is, it's, it's <laughs> a feedback loop, almost, yeah. But tell us a little bit about the Chinese factory, like the Foxconn factory, because that's one of my favorite stories from this book, that you managed to sneak into the factory where they make the iPhone by asking to use the restroom. After like <laughs> journalists for years and years have been trying to go through by official channels, you're like, I have to pee, can I go in? And they just let you? I yeah. still don't believe it, kind of. <laughs> well, so like I really approached this factory with trepidation because this is the factory that's, that's uh, so secretive that Reuters journalists were actually beaten by security guards just for taking pictures outside the walls. Oh, I never heard that story. So yeah, they it's you know, they some of the signage one academic pointed out was more aggressive than it is around Chinese military facilities. It's like, you know, beware or we'll port you off to the police. But we had you know, I really I wanted to go in anyways, um, to get a, a glimpse of it firsthand because if, if uh, I, I, I don't, some of you may know the story of the suicide epidemics that sort of broke out in 2010, uh, when conditions were so bad at these iPhone factories uh, operated by Foxconn, which is Apple's biggest contractor, uh, that they were suicides both out of protest and of just sheer desperation, where conditions were so bad that this is the only outlet that a lot of uh, people tragically felt they had. So I wanted to see if things had gotten better. Um, so I interviewed a bunch of workers outside the gates and I tried to find a way in. And we spent all day just kind of trying to go through the main entrance. We found this manager who said he'd let us in, but the security said there's no way. Without anything short of executive approval from the CEO, you're not getting in. So I said, fine. After the whole day had gone by, I realized that we'd just been at it for so long that I just had to pee really bad. 
And there was another side entrance that we noticed while we were walking by, and we just were like, you know what, it's, there's a bathroom, I see the sign over there, like, it's worth a shot, like, let's just, so we just asked over and over and over, and this poor guard was just like, I don't want to deal with this, just come right back, I'll be watching for you, and then we were in. It literally was just like that, and we ran. We just ran, and then dis fortunately and unfortunately, these factories are the size of small cities, so you can disappear pretty quickly, uh, you know, to a certain extent. And yeah, I mean, the size, the sheer scale of this thing was, I mean, at its height, there was 450,000 people working here, making wow. iPhones every day. Um, and it's, you know, you once you're in, you just get lost in these crowds because it's a little city, just like a city. It, it's kind of, you know, on the outskirts, it's a little rougher. There's like, you know, it looks like there's some chemical spillage on the ground. There's people just kind of like doing construction without any equipment and you walk in and then the buildings get a little bigger and all of a sudden there's sort of dormitory buildings and then you're kind of in a downtown area where there's cyber cafes and a 7-Eleven in the middle of this factory. And, you know, just surrounded by all these giant sort of you know, gray-looking factory blocks with workers, workers, workers everywhere. Um, it really was really striking to be, to be inside that and recognizing the fact that people who work here spend their entire lives, yeah. you know, bouncing between you work on the factory floor, you come spend a little money inside the, inside the um, internet cafe, you go to sleep. You do it for maybe a year before you burn out and maybe send some money home. Um, you're free to leave, of course, but you're getting paid so little that if you actually want to save any money, which is why you're there, then you, you, you don't do anything except work, eat, rinse, repeat. Yeah. It's like a cyberpunk novel. Yeah. I just imagine like the city growing bigger and bigger and like a rich cultural life blowing up in this middle with a 7-Eleven, like yeah. some kind of strange underground bar. Yeah, they would have to <laughs> hack it up a little bit. Yeah, I, I, there's, there ha you know, there was nothing that, there was no public space for them. There's no park. There's nothing nice. There's nothing, no, th no thought really to like catering to the human spirit in any way, really. One of my absolute favorite like little Easter egg things in your book is this poem that you quote, which I wish I had it on me so I could actually read it, but like this, this factory worker that was also a poet who ultimately committed suicide but yeah. wrote all these poems about life on the line and one of them is like this incredibly tragic story about like uh, a screw falling on the ground just like the bodies fall from the top of the building. Yeah. It's so bleak, but so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, th his poems are really striking. They're really, um, again, tragic, because he did take his own life, but he did leave behind a body of work that was actually published in China. Fascinating. Yeah, it is. And, you know, you just have to recognize that there are literally hundreds of thousands of people like him with thoughts that maybe aren't as articulated as eloquently as that, but are nonetheless maybe in that vein. Yeah. You saw so much of traveling the world for this book, I can't even imagine, because like, that's not the, even the most tragic things that you saw. I feel like you saw all kinds of, all kinds of things, like in Africa and, and in South America. I mean, what is the, like, the most remarkable thing? Like, what is the thing that you saw when you were traveling that like, took you the most out of yourself and made you realize, like, oh my god, there's a real global impact from this thing that's holding my hand? Yeah, it might have been the factory, but it was also, you know, in some parts, uh, you know, smartphones are so pervasive that even in uh, even the poorer, most uh, poverty-stricken parts of, you know, poor countries, smartphones are there and they're an aspirational object. And one of the ways that you can get them is if you pull them out of uh, the waste dumps. So I did visit this sprawling, the biggest waste dump in 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 Kenya, uh, where smartphones were considered one of the most valuable objects to pull out of there. Um, and that was one of those mind-blowing kind of, you know, just kind of brain scrambling experiences walking through there where people just spend every day collecting valuables. I mean, if they can uh, get enough of the raw materials, of the copper, then great. If they can get a phone that they can then sell to someone who can repair it a little bit, then great. Uh, most days you get nothing or something, or some textiles or something that you can resell for, 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 for cheap. But yeah, I mean, this was tragically desperate place. I mean, yeah, uh, when I was there, there was a, one of the pickers had fallen asleep on the entrance road and he had been run over by a lorry that had come through. And, 
they, nobody knew who he was or where his family was, so they just dragged his body off to the side and put a piece of cardboard over him um, because they're, you know, they, well, they, 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 no one had any idea what to do about it, basically. So, I mean, and yet there were people there, you know, still continuing the search for, for smartphones, and it, it, it's just there. It's literally there at every, in every part and every place of the world in different, different venues. I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of things in this world that we take for granted that are actually have like a really toxic effect. I mean, pr pretty much every electronic yeah. thing in our homes is is destined to a scenario yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. I want. I do want to make that clear. It's not like uh, Apple's the only you know like kingpin of the evil empire or anything. They're just a good example <laughs> of how this you know global global this this system you know works this this global supply chain and aftermarket uh, with black markets and, and e-waste collection and stuff so the, the iPhone is just a useful way to sort of tap into all that it's the same story with Androids give or take it's the same story with laptops with iPads with uh, surface what what have you you know this is just how things currently work That's for, wild. yeah it is um, yeah I mean I think about that a lot, but it's like, as a consumer, what can you do? It feels like impossible to not have a phone, maybe not to buy a new phone as frequently, yeah. to be more mindful about the way that you recycle it, but it seems like e-waste kind of just ends up there no matter what. Yeah, I think there are a number of things. You know, we could we could be better as consumers to, to put more pressure on Apple to do a little more, to, to take a little more responsibility as an industry leader. It already does a little more mm -hmm. than its competition, but it's also the most valuable, richest com company in the world, so it can be expected to do a little more, I think. And yeah, there are alternatives. There are companies and nonprofits trying to make a difference. There's something called Fairphone, which tries to ethically source its entire supply chain. Wow. Um, and it's an interesting thing. Uh, Is it really expensive? You know, it's not that expensive. Um, I think the bigger criticism with it is that it just doesn't work quite as well yet. Uh, so we, we, you know, we have now these expectations that things have to work as well as the iPhone. Things have to be magic. Things they have to be basically magic. Basically, magic in order to satisfy us. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's the idea, and that's the idea that animates these, and that's what Steve Jobs literally said. And you know, it does. It has taken hold of our imagination. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question about. Uh, <laughs> I know that when you turned in your book, it was like a hundred thousand words over word count. And I want to know what you cut. <laughs> yeah. I want to know what stories you cut that you wish you could have kept in the book. Um, there's a few things. I, I guess the biggest scene that we cut was lithium is really interesting because lithium powers electronics batteries, but it not just in smartphones uh, and in tablets, but also in electric cars. So it's called the sort of the, the, the next petroleum or the white petroleum because it's going to be one of these key resources uh, that that is really gonna be critical to the future. So we went uh, to uh, another part of Bolivia where the biggest lithium deposit in the world is. 50% of the world's known reserves are in this one giant salt flat. Wow. It's huge. You go, uh, people, it's, it's a kind of a minor tourist site because if you go in it, it's flat and white as far as the eye can see. And tourists like to take pictures where you can mess with perspective like that because you can make it look like somebody's like really tiny and you're eating your friend if you're standing <laughs> ten feet in front of them. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that's this, like Instagram made that happen. Right? Yeah, that is. It's, it's one of those it's Instagram, Instagram is eating sponsored the world. tourism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we did a whole. We went to this town and we kind of investigated how what it looks like to be on the frontier of this new resource boom. It felt a little too tangential to to the iPhone and the book to include, but there's a great you know, episode. We really had to talk people into c bringing us out to the mines because they were convinced that it was guarded by snipers, and we went... Because it's va so valuable? Because it's so valuable, so valuable, and it's so controversial. Bolivia is very... Um, it's a very left-wing radical government, and they take their resource protection very seriously. It has this history like we mentioned earlier, of resource exploitation and of the indigenous population being uh, severely exploited for uh, mineral extraction. So they're very, very critical of anyone that wants to come in and mine their stuff. So the government's kind of trying to experiment with it because it could be this big economic boom, too. Um, so it, that was... I'm going to try to try to publish something about that, that whole sort of investigation because that was an interesting part, too. Um, yeah.
Well, look forward to that. Yeah. Um, I just got word that it's time for questions and answers, so I would love to hand it over to the crowd. Does anybody have any? Yep. Yeah, just a reminder. <laughs> Everyone's got a burning question about Raise your stuff. hands and I'll bring the microphone to you. Uh, keep in mind, our Live Talks LA questions generally start with a W or an H, sometimes a D. They are typically short. There is no such thing as a two-part question, and only you get to ask follow-up questions. W, H, or D? Thank you. <laughs> um, I would like to know about that episode in which you say that Phil Schiller, um, he, wanted, he wanted to have a physical keyboard uh, on the iPhone, such as the BlackBerry. Yeah. And so you published that because Tony Fidel told you. Right. Uh, and both of them have said it's not true. So R what's going on with that? Keyboard gate. Keyboard gate, yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, this was really fascinating to me. Um, because I interviewed Tony Fidel, who was the vice president uh, in charge of iPod. He was really a rising star at the company at the time, and therefore he was a prime candidate to run the entire iPhone project within Apple. And he was kind of vying with another uh, executive for control of the project. So he was in a lot of these early meetings, um, and I did a lengthy interview with him on the record, and he told me this anecdote about how, you know, as I detail in the book, there was this sort of battle inside Apple between approaches to what the iPhone was actually going to be. Was it going to be an iPod with a phone tacked onto it, or was it going to be the sort of the refinement of that crazy rig we talked about earlier? Um, but it turns out there was, according to, to multiple sources, um, Tony Fidel told me this story. On the record, there was uh, someone who was arguing for a third mode, and everybody probably remembers the BlackBerry just a little bit, right? Yeah, fondly. It, fond, like those tiny little buttons that you sprain your thumbs typing in uh, different uh, yeah, messages, and it was popular with like the, the business crowd for a bit. But so Phil Schiller, who was in charge of marketing, who saw that it, there was this market segment that was already very popular with a certain subset, it was proven. So it was kind of his job to be the marketing guy. Um, according to Tony Fidel, he told me this elaborate, detailed story, uh, which was even more detailed than the snippet that I published in the book uh, about how Phil really went to bat for this idea, and he thought they were making the wrong call by uh, including a touchscreen uh, instead of a hard keyboard. Which, you know, given the benefit of hindsight, right? 2020. It's 2020, it's easy to say, like, okay, of course, look at what's all touchscreens now, take it out of your pocket and look at it. But at the time, it could have broken either way. We really, you know, there was a really good market, uh, uh, a case to be made for, for pursuing that approach. Now, other sources told me that, to that, that uh, Phil Schiller was opposed for many reasons to multi-touch in general, that he uh, was never really interested in that approach. Um, and then Tony Fidel told me this very detailed story on the record, and I went ahead and uh, pu published Tony's account. Now, as soon as it broke, of course, uh, maybe Tony didn't realize how strongly worded he had put this thing, um, and it became clear that he kind of wanted to walk it back. It, 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 this is my interpretation. I'm not going to speculate why he uh, disowned the quote, but I, you know, I had our conversation was on the record and recorded, and he. And they had, there were tapes. <laughs> so, tapes. So I think what happened was he, it, it came out, Phil Schiller then, you know, because he's coming from the position of Apple, which has the ability to deny anything and everything at any given time, he said, that's not how it went. And his denial was very vague. Maybe it was more muted or whatever. Uh, but then I think Tony probably got an angry phone call from Apple or from Phil, and then he decided to walk it back too. Uh, but uh, fortunately, I do have the tapes, I do have other substantiation, and um, I think it's just a case of trying to do some reputation management on the behalf of the actors. So I hope that answers the question. There's a microphone coming your way. Hi. Um, what's the true cost of the iPhone? The true, the true cost? In what terms? Like, I mean, the economics from, um, like, yeah. What's the profit that they're making on each iPhone? Like, yeah. So oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. So that's a good. It's a great question. Um, and there are basically technology, financial information firms, 
whose chief purpose is to figure that out. Because Apple doesn't make public how much it pays for component parts, it doesn't make public even what components it specifically uses in a given model. So there are entire companies that more or less exist to as soon as an iPhone is released, they go in, they take the screen off, they analyze the chips, they say what, com what came from where, so they say, oh, Qualcomm built this chip, oh, Samsung built this, and then they can make cost estimates. Uh, it, it's remarkable. You know, some put the profit margin in every iPhone as high as like 60%. Wow. And which makes it one of the most profitable products ever created. Um, 60%. I mean, some people quibble with that and say that if you count the R&D and sort of the uh, you know other other feedstocks that that aren't directly related to labor and device uh, and component uh, manufacturing and that kind of thing, then maybe it's lower, like 40%. But it's still huge. It's still just incredible the amount of profit margin that they get off these things. And you know they do that by keeping labor cheap, by like grouping labor, by sort of uh, you know they're they're such a powerful. Uh, client for most of these suppliers that what they say goes and they can really bend uh, vendors to their whims and get really good deals. That, like the mineral elements or like the elements in it, it's like $1.29 per phone or something, right? Is that what that's on that? Yeah, it's barely over a dollar. The actual value of the metals, if you were just going to try to melt it down and sell everything off, it was just, it's you, gold. You could get a little gold out of it. There's a tiny How many iPhones gold. would it take to buy one iPhone in the gold? <laughs> <laughs> like 700 iPhones? Or right, something? exactly. <laughs> it depends on what model you want to get. It's like a conceptual art project. <laughs> uh, anyone else? Yeah, over here. What's your favorite story of like a very small decision that ended up making a huge impact to the world? Mm. Oh, interesting. Can we narrow it down, being within Apple or without? Either way. Well, I think ultimately, um, we have to go with the big lens, the, the, the wide lens one. And you know, the, the fact is, is that whether or not Steve Jobs invented this thing, it, he was, you know, he had immense power at Apple. He, it was his decision whether or not this was gonna be a phone at all. And there was a long stretch where it was in doubt whether or not the project was ever gonna go forward. There's, I think, one of the funny, funnier quotes that I picked up was that, you know, he had this small subset of ex executives who were trying to trying to talk him into it, uh, and he kept telling them, he's like, oh, the market's too tough, and smartphones are only going to be for the pocket protector crowd. <laughs> he thought that maybe it was just going to be for nerds, and that like it was only for the the BlackBerry power users, and he just he didn't see at first uh, that th that there was more potential there. And again, that's the power of having all these different forces, is that he could see this research project that had bubbled up and say, like, okay, that's interesting. Maybe we could do something with that. He could see the design work that Johnny Ive and his team was doing and the, the cool-looking iPods that were coming out. So I think it was kind of on the razor's edge for a while, whether or not Apple was ever even going to do a phone, period. And then if it never happened, then maybe, you know, this whole mess never comes about in the first place. So I think that's probably the most, the biggest decision is him finally being talked into it and saying, we're going to go for it. And it rippled out in kind of substantial ways. You know what blew my mind in your book is discovering that the f carriers, like the actual phone carriers, didn't see the phone until it was unveiled. Yeah. Like even though they'd had all these negotiations about how it would work yeah. as a business thing, like they didn't actually know what it looked like. Yeah. Isn't that incredible? I was like, Pff. Yeah, I mean, at the time, it was even more incredible because the, the, the networks like Verizon and Singular at the time, they wouldn't give deals to any handset manufacturers uh, remotely close to the one that, they, that Singular ended up giving Apple, which is that. Yeah. Apple demanded full creative control over the design, and there no ifs and or buts about it. It was just going to be that way. So if Singular wanted this exclusive deal with Apple, which again had this world-beating iPod product at the time, then they were going to have to, you know, play ball with this. So it is crazy that they were able to. So yeah, so like the CEO of, <laughs> of Singular, like a, a couple of weeks before the launch was like, oh, this is cool. And 
<laughs> like, right? Yeah. Like, like, good thing, too. What a relief. I yeah. know, it could have been such a turkey. Right. Uh, anyone else? Down front. Do you like the iPhone? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the million dollar question. I am, I think at this point, just deeply neutral about the iPhone. I, you know, I use it every day. I, you know, I used it to report this book. I used it to record interviews. I used it to get my, find my way around new cities. I couldn't have done a lot of the things I ended up doing uh, for this book with it like FaceTime, like the photos. Um, do I like it is probably the deepest and darkest question that we could wade into <laughs> and maybe it's too, too ugly for the stage. I, 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 you know, I, I think it's a fascinating subject and I wish that I could fully like everything about it, you know, that goes on behind the screen. Um, I think it's possible to, to, to like a device in a way that we deserve to, but not quite there yet. It's like you don't really get a choice about whether or not you like it, right? I mean, you just need it. Right. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, you could say you could make a, you know, and you could accept yourself. You could, like, sort of <laughs> exile yourself from, from modern society, but, you know, a, sp you, a lot of jobs now just, you know, the, the new norm is that you always have a phone, that you're on call, that you can write an email from wherever you are, that you can use the Slack app. God, I, 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 there's, I don't know if there's a more hated app in the world than <laughs> Slack's you know, workflow app. Um, I should clarify that it's not the iPhone that I dislike, it's the way that sort of the, the standard, the global standard as it sits now for producing smartphone products is, uh, is problematic and can, can be addressed better than it is now. We got a hand in the back. Did you need the permission from Apple to write the book and uh, did they have any control about uh, anything that you wrote? Oh, no. Uh, no, I, I made them aware from the very beginning that I was embarking on this project and I asked them if they would like to supply any, uh, you know, engineers or make anyone available for interview. I asked for specific interviews. Um, I did uh, really tr reach out to them and was transparent about what I was doing, but again, because they're so secretive, because they have such a controlled press, strat uh, press strategy, they were, I think they were nervous about what would come out of the book, so they decided ultimately not to make uh, anyone available. And back to your point, I asked Phil Schiller for interviews through these channels too, and, and he de declined them all, so. Have you heard anything since? Like, since the book's come out? From, From Apple? Apple? No, dead silence. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. We have time for two more questions. Hi, I'm so anxious to read this book, I would do it right now. Um, <laughs> well, thank you. When you um, snuck into the China factory, weren't you afraid you'd get shot or imprisoned forever or? <laughs> You know, some, and did anybody yeah, ever you? find you? Uh, no one ever found us. So, I, it was, maybe it was just the adrenaline talking, but, you know, for the first 20 minutes I was in there, it was just kind of all about, go. I was like a shark, you just got to keep moving or you might die. Uh, but I was, uh, once I got, once I kind of realized what we had done, I was more worried for the, the translator who was based in Shanghai, was a Chinese national, and who, you know, if I got in any, trouble, there are, you know, certain diplomatic out, outlets that, uh, I, I, you know, that, that I would enjoy that maybe my, uh, my translator would not have. So I, I was more worried about them than, than myself um, because, well, I, you know, again, maybe it was just the adrenaline, you know, it was, uh, we kind of, you know, were smart to get out, I think, fast, but, but before we got too lazy or too complacent in there because we kind of realized after an hour we were kind of pushing our luck, so we, so we left um, before. At a certain point you were in deep enough that you, people started look, looking at you like, oh, he must, he must be supposed to be here because he's right, here. Right, because we're in the middle of this thing, like this, uh, you know, maybe he's some developer or some, you know, uh, 
some junior executive or something. I don't know, because, yeah, in the beginning, when we first got it, people were giving us crazy looks. But once we were deep enough in, maybe people wouldn't look up from their phones, of course. <laughs> yeah. And our final question for the evening. Thank you. Uh, what difference do you see in Apple as a company on the iPhone as a product before and after uh, Steve Jobs? Mm. Yeah. Um, I, that's a, it's, it's an interesting question uh, because I think the conventional wisdom is that Steve Jobs was the innovator and kind of, you know, brought the world all of these game-changing products, the iPod, the iPhone, and the iPad. Uh, no, few companies have ever had a run like that. Um, and since then, Tim Cook has taken over and has put the emphasis on operations, on scaling up, on getting the phone to market, getting, you know, expanding everything that was already there, and has succeeded wildly, you know. He's turned Apple from, you know, a like a, just a product-based sort of innovation company into maybe what could be like, you know, the next GE or something more monolithic that can do these big product lines for, that are maybe a little bit more boring, but a little bit more um, uh, safe and profitable and dependable. So when I set out, I, you know, to, 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 to report this book, I kind of thought that that, uh, that conventional wisdom was BS. But one thing I did learn about reporting about this culture is that Steve Jobs, whether he was the inventor that we hold him up as or not, his mythology itself, as this guy who brought, who, you know, made the Mac, the Apple II, and then had these other string of hit products, gave him a power within Apple as sort of the unquestioned sort of decider. And when he did get on board with the iPhone, as we talked about earlier, he was able to put the pedal down and say, this is it. We're pouring everything into it, and that's just the way it's going to be. Now, today, not even Tim Cook has that power. He has people on the board who are more critical of the moves that he's making. He has to be more diplomatic. He can't, you know, just kind of step into a room and say, like, Apple car, this is what's next. We're all doing it. <laughs> Everybody drop what you're doing. People would go, like, no, and there'd be, like, a boardroom revolt, maybe. So it's become a, it has really become a more safe company, and um, a lot of the iPhone inventors that I interviewed really sort of lament that that has gone, that the ability to kind of turn this huge subsection of a company into basically a startup, uh, only Steve Jobs really possessed that, that ability, both the, per the cult of personality, the mythology, and sort of the, uh, had sort of the, the, the social capital in the company to do that. Well, that brings us to the end of a very interesting evening. Thank you, both of you, for coming to our stage. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you.